for anyone who's watching and doesn't realize this stuff, and even for those people who do, uh, that this is going to involve everyone on the planet. Yeah. The first highlight there is really important that all inhabitants of the earth will have to take a side. Why are we saying this? Why does anybody care about a day? Why would Satan care about a day? Why would God care about a day? Why are these Seventh Day Adventists talking about all this stuff? And why should anyone care? When God does something, Satan always uses that for himself. Yeah. And he counterfeits that thing. It's the whole point of the counterfeit system. And he, he knows he can't, you know, extinguish the truth. So he just yeah. tries to counterfeit all of these things. Welcome back to another episode of Truth Matters. I'm here again with Mackenzie Drebbit. I'm Matthew Shawnshea, and today we're going to be tackling uh, an interesting issue that we know is probably going to um, hopefully educate a lot of people, but also show people what the Bible says about this Sabbath Sunday issue. Uh, but before we get into that, we want to just touch on a couple things. Mackenzie, can you update some of the people watching and people listening what's happened to our YouTube page and why we haven't posted recently? So if you have noticed, we haven't posted any videos for the last couple weeks, and that is because we got a strike on our channel. And initially, uh, they said, which is actually against the guidelines, that they were going to lock us for 90 days. But... Uh, we were able to post again this um, past episode, The Truth Matters, that came out after the break there. But we know that this is going to keep happening more and more, mm -hmm. that we're going to keep being flagged, keep getting these strikes. So we wanted to encourage everybody to go to adtv.watch and make sure that you're on our platform so that you don't miss things and you're getting that information because actually we're going to start because we have to. We can't put everything on YouTube because it is just going to kill the channel. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start releasing things there either first and or exclusively. So you won't be getting everything on YouTube because they are flagging all of our material. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do a little bit of a check before it goes out onto YouTube. But sometimes that isn't enough. And then only after things are posted, then they start saying that we have a problem um, because of whatever issue that, that it might be. So make sure you're going to the alternate platforms. Yeah, and uh, just uh, please also pray for McKenzie as he's uh, a little under the weather today. Uh, and that's also, you know, hindering our ability to to get things done uh, in an efficient manner. So, um, you know, even though there's a lot of roadblocks in the way, we just we just got to keep going and do what we can. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to be opening a Rumble page as well. Yeah. Uh, but we do encourage you to go to adtv.watch because honestly... Not everything will be on Rumble. Correct. We're going to use that um, the same way we use YouTube to get the awareness out and attention of new people, but not everything will be able to go on Rumble either. Right. So go to our Telegram. If you haven't joined our Telegram group already... Go join our Telegram group. Go to adtv.watch. And don't just go to the website. Make sure that you log in. Yeah. Make sure you create an account on the website because all the tools are unlocked then. And there's new tools coming all the time. Yeah, and we're going to do a little short with that to kind of show you guys how it works because I don't think everybody really understands how much is is uh, possible at adtv.watch yeah. with bookmarks and note-taking and being yeah. able to share that information from a dashboard. So... Uh, just, I guess we're going to be saying this more and more, but start getting used to transferring over to this other platform. Our our days on YouTube are uh, dwindling quickly, and uh, we know that, and we want you guys to know that. If for some reason our channel is cut off completely, uh, and we are unable to reach out uh, to you know our followers after this, just start heading over to adtv.watch. And you'll um, get a message on the message board if you have a login, if something serious happens, yeah. we'll be notifying. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of, of creating a user account. We can actually send out messages and kind of give you guys updates of what's happening. Uh, and as we weren't able to do, we were completely locked out of our YouTube account for weeks. Yeah. Um, and another interesting thing that we wanted to do before we 
go into our talk today is talk about the camp meeting that's coming yes. up here. So uh, <clears throat> we're going to be in August. We're going to be having a camp meeting here at AD's property. And uh, we really encourage people to come out because um, we've got Barbara O'Neill this year. We've got yep. Randy Skeet this year. Scott from Little Light's coming back up. Yep. Uh, you and I are going to be contributing some to this whole thing. Timon's going to be contributing yep. some to this whole thing. There's going to be practicals about gardening and learning. There's going to be prophecy. It's all about preparing yep. for uh, going home to to meet Jesus and, and to be with God in heaven, but also preparing for how we're going to sustain um, during the close of Earth's history here. Yeah, no, I really encourage everybody to go and register because you need to register because there is limited seats available and we'll have meals, so you have to register for those meals. Make sure you register, go there right now. Um, it is going to be a, an amazing camp meeting. We have a great lineup, like yeah. we just said. And uh, um, What are the dates? It's going to be August 21st to the 27th. So the 21st will be open registration at noon. And then the first evening sort of plenary will be on that 21st. And then the full thing will start the next day on the 22nd and go right through to the 27th. And where do they register? So they can go to the website, campmeeting.amazingdiscoveries.org. Or just go to amazingdiscoveries.org and right there on the main page, you'll see the camp meeting. Click there. It says register now for people coming on site because uh, some people in the past have registered when they're they're not showing up. Yeah. But make sure you register. Let us know you're coming so that we can make sure that things are available for you for when you do come. Mm -hmm. and, and please, we appreciate registering if you're not coming, but please don't because it, <laughs> it throws off our, our uh, preparation a bit. So if you're not attending in person, there's no need to register. You yeah. don't need to register to get links. All that stuff will be available. Um, you can still watch these things if you're not in person. But uh, uh, if you're coming in person, please register. Now, I do want to make a comment there because not everything or a very few will be available if you're not here. Right. So we have workshops that are happening. We're not even filming them. So you won't be able to even get that content after camp meeting. Right. You'll only get that here. Plus, we'll be showing some uh, sneak previews into some other projects that you won't be getting if you are off-site. Yeah. Uh, so I really encourage everybody that can to come here. Right, that's true, to get the full experience and to really, you know... Um, and be with people of the same people. mindset of, yeah. And look, we don't know how, like we saw with the health stuff, we don't know how long we're going to be able to do stuff like this. So this year we are able. Yeah. And there are no restrictions uh, for traveling and gathering. So please, if you can, join us in person this year here at the property yeah. and go to ADTV or amazingdiscoveries.org to register and find the camp meeting information. And actually, one more thing, while we're doing sort of uh, some things that we're up to, we're going to be at ASI, which is Adventist Layman Services and Industries in the States, this, the first week of August. So if you're going to ASI or you're thinking about it, we're going to be there. We're going to have a booth. Me and Matt will be there. Um, and we'd love to talk to you and love to see you in person. Yeah, come say hi to us if you're going to be at ASI. And uh, with that, let's dive right in. So we're going to be talking about this, um, you know, in the last several episodes, we've talked about a lot of these principles that are going to be coming up. Uh, we talked about um, how Satan's going to be appearing, and uh, he's coming with all sorts of help and dead appearing to rise. And I'd just like to read a quote uh, that kind of gets us in the frame of mind for anyone who's watching and doesn't realize this stuff, and even for those people who do, uh, that this is going to involve everyone on the planet. Yeah. And there's no escaping making a choice. There's no sitting on the sidelines. And let's take a look at what it says. It says, The great conflict that Satan created in the heavenly courts is soon, very soon, to be decided forever. Soon, all the inhabitants of the earth will have taken sides, either for or against the government of heaven. Now, as never before, Satan is exercising his deceiving power to mislead and to destroy every unguarded soul. We are called upon to arouse the people to prepare for the great issues before them. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring yep. to the forefront, what are these issues? 
we must give a warning to those who are standing on the very brink of ruin. So that's pretty much what this whole program is about, right? It's, it's not just exposing the, the plan, but also to show the very principles that underlie the, the whole push. So and I think that the first highlight there is really important, that all inhabitants of the earth will have to take a side. Yeah. You know, some people like to be, what do they say, like Switzerland, yeah. right? You know, no, we're just neutral. Unfortunately, at this time in Earth's history, there's no neutral ground because it's going to be of such an extent and to such a, uh, a severity that you'll have to either choose with the right or with the left, if I could say it like that. Mm -hmm. We're not talking politically right or left. We're talking about right and wrong. Yeah. And uh, people will have to make that decision, either for or against the government of heaven, as it says on the screen there, right? Exactly. And so uh, that's what we're digging at. Like, I know it's people, the viewership has been really interested in all the talking about, you know, demons appearing to be uh, people uh, coming back from the dead. Now, I'm actually going to run through a couple points of what we've covered to kind of frame this whole thing. So we looked at the Christian power is going to rise and unite church and state. It's going to do this with the aid of miracles. And we, we don't call them miracles. The Bible says that they look like miracles. So we've noticed a couple people <coughs> saying that, you know, don't call them miracles because they're not. Well, remember, the Bible says, you know, he deceives by means of these miracles. Yeah. So we're, we're not saying they're miracles, but the Bible defines what's coming. The deception will be used in what look like miracles. We covered in great detail Satan impersonating Christ, bringing back false apostles, bringing people back to life, and the whole object of their attention. Again, we're, we're just advocating what we understand the truth to be and asking people to just listen and, and let the seeds plant. But we, after all, Satan appears and apostles are here and dead people come back to life even though they're demons. Uh, and, and it all seems like it. I get that Satan doesn't really have the power to, to bring people back to life, but it's going to seem like it. Yeah. That the whole object is just to do one thing, yeah. tell you that the Sabbath has changed from the seventh day to the first day, from Saturday to Sunday. And so what we want to dive into in this episode and the next couple episodes is why are we saying this? Why does anybody care about a day? Why would Satan care about a day? Why would God care about a day? Why are these Seventh-day Adventists talking about all this stuff? And why should anyone care? How is this such a critical point? Because it doesn't seem <clears throat> like that uh, life or death when it comes to this point. Oh, yeah. it's a day, it's a this, it's a... You can, you can worship but, God any day. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's the mindset. I worship, I worship God every day. Exactly. But there is this depth to the topic that we're hopefully going to unravel a little bit mm -hmm. over the next couple episodes to show the actual importance and how it's going to play a role in this new world order that's actually going to take place because it's not just about power. It's not just about all this Money thing. And, this yeah. is about taking a side with the government of Satan or the government of heaven. That's yeah. really what it's, it's, it's going to come down to. Because these elites, they aren't... Um, it's not about worshiping them. It's not about... Uh, when when you look at all the levels of these guys, how they, they get to the ranks, they're not concerned... You could make an argument for certain ones that they are doing it out of selfishness, but the guys who are really pushing, it's not only because they want power or they want money. It's for the greater good, the, 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 the end goal that yeah. they're pushing for, and they know how to play the long game. Yeah. If they die in the meantime, that's unfortunate, but... They are all working towards this one goal. Yeah. And gosh, we have so much evidence we could go through to show that. And in fact, one at some point we're going to show, even in the UN Security Council building, a mural and that sits behind all these world leaders when they make these decisions that show yeah. exactly this plan that you're, everything is funneling yeah. towards. So, and, and I, I think we try to do a good job on this program of showing what the Bible says about things and like letting that be our guide. So... Let's walk through some of this perspective and start shedding some light and start connecting the dots on how God 
feels about this issue. Not Seventh-day Adventists or other Christian denominations or yep. the world. Let's just see what God has to say about this. Because our opinion in the end doesn't matter. It doesn't. Because it has to be what is truth, and if truth comes from God, then it has to be what God thinks about this topic. And, and he's going to tell us very clearly. Right. And so a lot of times, like, you know, we've all had discussions. You know, I wasn't a Sabbath keeper or a Sabbath believer, but eventually if you're saying, okay, well, I just want to know what the truth is, and then once you accept the Bible as the truth, then you just start going through and saying, okay, well, what does God instruct? And then that shapes our worldview. And it doesn't mean that everybody right away is like all of a sudden uh, in alignment with every principle of the Bible, but you start to have to like put yourself aside in these things if there's a difference between what God says and what how you're living, and start to make changes towards how God has has prescribed these things. Yep. Now, the frame of mind we often talk about is that, you know, the nature of what we're dealing with is deception. And I find it very interesting because most of the people you say Sabbath and Sunday about, not only do they think that it's not like uh, an issue, but they think that Sunday is perfectly fine, forgetting that like well, that's the nature of deception, right? Uh -huh. Not only are you doing something thinking it's fine, but anybody who tries to approach you talking about it, you say, well, no, it, that could has nothing to do with anything. Yeah. Well, then that's a pretty good deception, like because nobody actually gives it any grounds. Yeah. So framing our mind to being prepared for deception should open up the possibility mm -hmm. that things we think now are true may not actually be true. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not a very good deception. So how do we know that this is what we're up against. Let's again use the Bible as, as the guide. It says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So what's I find really interesting about this verse is it says false Christs, right? So it's it's inferring that this is a, a Christian counterfeit, right? It's not just a generic counterfeit. It's not false Buddhas or false Krishnas. They're yep. false Christs. And they're false prophets associated with Christ. So they can't just be false prophets and other denom or other religious thought. This yep. is all related to um, the uh, Christian aspect of For the sure. whole thing. And we've talked about uh, showing great wonders, and we, that word translates to miracles in other places. But what we didn't talk much about are the great signs. Mm -hmm. What sign is it that will be such a deceiving aspect within this whole thing? So. As we you know, uncover these things, we want people to have the tools to challenge when these things start happening, to challenge these in a biblical way. And so what are we supposed to do when all this false Christ, false prophets start to come to fruition in the real world? And the Bible clearly tells us in 1 John chapter 4, we're going to start, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. So we have to test these entities. Yep. And look, if they are of God, they're going to have no problem being tested, yep. right? So the, the test is, is good for both sides. Mm -hmm. Test the spirits because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Isaiah 8.20 says, To the law and to the testimony, which is one we've looked at a lot, if they speak not according to this word, it is no light in them. So if they come back and they contradict, there's two elements here, the law and the testimony, that they have to stand up to both of those elements when we test these things. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we see prove all things. So we're supposed to go out and really challenge these things and prove them. And when we understand what is true after following these instructions, you hold on to it. It says, hold fast to that which is good. So these are instructions by which any person at any point can take their Bible and start to test these spirits against what the Bible says, the law and the testimony. And the key with this is that <clears throat> if it speaks not according to this word. Yeah. So if it says, oh, well, you know, maybe it's against what the Bible says, but God told me this, then it's not the God that you think it is. Yeah. You know, we need to make sure that it lines up with the word of God, which is the Bible. And if it doesn't align up with the Bible, then it's an error. Yeah. And that's really where the whole foundation starts. If you start tearing that away, uh, that's a whole nother conversation, yeah. but you have no structure because no. everything else is just feeling or impulse or idea, your own thoughts. And when we are talking about truth, it can't be based on our own thoughts no. because 
the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Absolutely. And we don't have that ability inertly to know what is truth or error unless we have something to compare it to. Right. It's like looking at the counterfeit, looking at the real thing. You have to study the real thing in order to see the counterfeit. So if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, then it's not the truth. Prove all things. And we know that they're going to use the Bible. But even when they use the Bible, it will be in a contradictory manner. So that's why I think it gives two elements, the law and the testimony, because we know it can't speak to the law, yep. because it's the thing, even, even the man of sin is defined as the lawless one. So there's this aspect of the law, even says teaching for uh, commandments, the doctrine of men. Yep. So again, it's commandments, the law, man versus the law of God. Here we see the man of sin, the lawless one, is again in contrast with the law-keeping ones. Yep. So the law sits at the center of this whole thing and will be, in my view, one of the main mechanisms we can use to expose this whole thing. Yep. Where most of the Christian world says the law is devoid and nailed to the cross, well then this is, again, setting up in, in this worldview that we're advocating for, setting you up for the deception yep. that's coming. And so these signs that we see throughout the Bible are contrasting between two primary systems. There's only two in the world. As we saw in the first quote, you're either for the government of God or you're against. And we see that there's two signs of allegiance within this whole framework. Yep. And there's only two sides of the party. So we know what the two names of these signs are. One is the mark of the beast, which is probably one of the most well-known, yes, most misunderstood yep. prophetic terms in the Bible. <clears throat> and the other one is probably a less known uh, phrase known as the seal of God. Yeah. And so when it says there's great signs that will deceive, we see that these are m like marks or signals of which allegiance or whose authority are you acknowledging yeah. within this picking of these two systems. So while we haven't defined what these are, we must know that these are the two elements that would define which kingdom you are following or, or acknowledging as your uh, authority. And one, one thing that I want to point out is, in the Bible, both of these terms are in the Bible. We didn't just make them up. Mark of the beast and the seal of God. And <clears throat> that word seal actually is the same word, meaning the same thing as mark. So you either get the mark of the beast or the mark of God. And that's where it says you're either going to choose with the heavenly or you're going to choose with the non-heavenly, mm -hmm. right? It's going to come to, to, to this head. And we can see this perfectly clear in some of the examples here in Revelation yeah. that we have the mark of the beast and then we have the sea of the living God. Revelation 16, 2, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. So this is a real thing that is going to happen that these people, and when, when they receive the mark of the beast, the plagues will be falling on them. Mm -hmm. So you don't want the mark of the beast. Exactly. And that's kind of what I want all people to ask themselves. It's like, after you look at what happens to people who have this mark, and you see that the full wrath of God is poured out on them, any person, any rational, sane person should yeah. say, how do I avoid getting this? And the answer, there's only one answer. You receive the seal of God. Yeah. That, that is the only, that's the 100% certain way that you know you can't get the mark of the beast or that you won't is if you have the seal of the living God. And I've had people come up to me and say, well, the seal of God's not in the Bible. No, it definitely is. Revelation 7-2 it says, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And it was the command was given that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those which had not the seal of God in their foreheads. Yep. So here's the contrast. People who have the mark are receiving all of these terrible things, which are justified, but it's still terrible. And he, on the other side, it's like hurt everything except... Yeah. Anyone who has the seal of God. Yeah. So here's the contrast between these two systems, and I'm not sure a ton of Christians even know that there is a, a counter to the mark of the beast. There's there's this seal of God aspect. And another thing 
going back to what Jesus said, he said that uh, a house left empty will be filled. Mm -hmm. So he gave the example that the one person cleaned their house, they took out the one demon, but they didn't fill it with God. Right. So what happened? Seven more demons, even worse than the first, came in. And that's the thing. You can't just say, oh, I, I know, I don't want the mark of the beast. I don't want the plagues. But... I don't really want the seal of God either. <laughs> you, you have to choose one or the other. That's exactly right. You if, you're, if you're blank from the seal of God, you will end up receiving the mark of the beast. And I'll give a quick example. I've heard stories people come to me and talk who are uh, former Catholics and have come out. And the Catholic system is a double-edged sword because let's say the house was filled with Catholicism and the person's done with Catholicism because they see all the stuff that's going on that doesn't match what the Bible is. And they lump all of Christianity in with uh, Roman Catholicism. Yeah. So they clean out their house and get rid of it. And then they go wandering in the world and they come back with New Age spiritualism and seancing yep. and communicating with the deads and all these other things that they filled their house up because the, the the thing they kicked out, they thought all of Christianity was is the same as Catholicism when it's, it's clearly yep. not. That this is the type of thing that's happening to real world people today. I've had people come tell me, oh, my, my brother left Catholicism, but now he's way deep into the New Age yeah. and I can't even talk to him about the Bible anymore. So this system that that represents Satan's government on earth, which is the Catholic system, can not only trick you in being in it, but it can trick you by being so over it that yeah. you end up like following all this other stuff in the world that just degrades the Bible and, and the God and, and what Jesus has done. Well, that's what it says in Revelation 13, that the, the seal of God, there's a slight difference on the application of the seal of God and the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's in your forehead or in your hand, but with the seal of God, it has to be an intellectual thing. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that you chose. Satan doesn't care if you just actually worship him or worship him vicariously through not wanting to worship God. So, or just not wanting to be have your life shaken up. I mean, because at the end, it's no buy, no sell, right? And we're kind of getting a little off track. But like, but it's like people want to not be unplugged from the system. They want to be able to yeah. still move. And so like they're... Satan doesn't care whether you agree with it because you don't want to be kicked out or you agree with it because you actually want exactly. to worship that. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're 100% right. So the big question that we're going to tackle is why do we say, as Adventists, and here on Truth Matters, you know, really hammering on the point that Sunday is the center of the controversy? So we'll see when Satan comes back, this is what we're, we believe he's going to do. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. Okay, that makes sense. He's going to come back and pretend to say and do the same things as Jesus. He heals the diseases of the people, and then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to change the Sabbath to <coughs> Sunday and commands all to hallow the day. What does hallow mean? To make holy. To make holy, right? So he's saying, I'm... I'm making holy this day, which he is blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day, again, he's not trying to take the seventh day as his own. He's trying to totally yeah. move it to another point, are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with truth and light. So what are these apostles and on all these fallen angels that are going to appear with him at, at the same time? They're all going to be saying the same thing. And you yeah. guys are just not listening. Mm -hmm. You're not listening. And so... It says, Ellen White writes, that this is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. So <clears throat> the totality of all of this stuff happening, again, we can see now why people would unite church and state, why people would believe it, because the deception is so great. Now, the main point that they're coming to change, yep. there's a group of people that says, no, we want no part of this. And that's why we don't promote the conservative right side. We don't pro promote either side, because... Whether you're on the left side or the right side, <clears throat> the right side can still promote these Christian ideologies because Satan is going to be coming as Christ. Satan's going to send his people first. So it's going to slowly start building and it's going to be even stronger and stronger and stronger. Fire is going to come down from heaven. All, all these overwhelming miracles. Mm -hmm. And then he will come and then say, hey, 
well, maybe we shouldn't get too far past the punchline, but this is this is where it really divides because he is as hateful towards the Sabbath as God is towards Sunday. Right. Because that is the whole um, conflict. Because if he can take away the Sabbath, he takes away everything from God. And we're going to see how that's true by breaking down sun worship itself. And so here we have Satan claiming he's hallowed different day than God. And then in God's word, <clears throat> he says on, in, in Exodus 20, therefore, and I'm just going to read the end, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Yep. So here's a contrast between these two entities saying they both hallowed something on different days. And that's going to be a theme that we are going to see throughout the whole episode. When God does something, Satan always uses that for himself, yeah. and he counterfeits that thing. It's the whole point of the counterfeit system. And he, he knows he can't you know, extinguish the truth, so he just yeah. tries to counterfeit all of these things. So the, the battle that we're going to uncover here is a first day versus a seventh day battle. And uh, there's some common thoughts in Christianity around this concept. The main points that are given from most of Christian viewpoints about why Sunday is celebrated is that it's celebrated as the resurrection of Jesus, and they call it the Lord's Day. So they yeah. say the resurrection of Jesus Day and the Lord's Day, these are the same things. They say that the apostles worshiped on Sunday uh, in the record on the first day. I shouldn't say Sunday because Sunday is nowhere in the Bible, but they say on the first day, yeah. therefore the Sabbath is now on this first day because they worship. But as you and I said, you can worship on any day. It's about what day did God hallow? What day did he make holy? Yeah. So yes, they did worship on the first day, but these are just some of the common thoughts. And then the last one is that the moral law or the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross anyway, and any attempt to keep them is legalism and reduces the uh, what Jesus did on, on the cross. And so over the next few episodes, we're going to tackle and pick apart all of these understandings. But we just want to acknowledge that this, we understand what the rest of the Christian world is saying about this. Yeah. And this is why we want to address this and, and pick this apart. Because we want to walk through the history now of sun worship and its relationship to the first day of the week. So most in the Christian world don't take the time to review this history, right? They just go on tradition. We've always done this. There's no reason not to. God doesn't care about a day. But Let's go through and see how God feels about this in relation to the tradition that's being kept. How does God feel about sun worship? And this is going to open our journey on picking apart what's really happening within this sun worship system. Yeah. This, the best place, I think, to start getting an idea of what God feels about all this is in Ezekiel 8. And in this is a record of Ezekiel's taken in vision by God and he's basically shown all of these terrible things that ancient Israel is doing. Because, you know, they had a, a roller coaster relationship with God. And I've often asked people, is like all, th all bad things the same in God's eyes? Well, this answers that. It shows that there's a hierarchy in God's view of something's abominable, but this is even worse, and this is even worse, and this is even worse. So we're going to read through this account and just look at what God says from ancient Israel, what's the ranking system that he looks at yep. in this whole thing. Okay, Ezekiel 8.1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. So we can see, you know, God's presence is now here. So what we have seen in other records, the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins even downward, fire. And from his loins even upward is the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand, and he took me by a lock of mine head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven. So he's now in the Spirit, kind of seeing all of this unfold. And he brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate. So we're dealing with what would be known as the sanctuary, the temple at yep. this point. And, and that looked toward the north, and we know north is in relation to where God resides in heaven. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy? So there's a, our first thing that we're seeing here that God's showing out. 
Verse 4, And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward, at the gate, again of the temple, of the altar, this image of jealousy is in the entry. So Mm -hmm. the first thing he's seeing is this, like, basically an idol set up, you know, near the gate of the temple. He said, there furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here. So this is our first scene of what God is saying he finds is an abomination, is an idol of jealousy. That I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Mm -hmm. So now our first indication that, okay, here's our baseline, is idolatry near the Lord's house. But there's something worse. Verse 7, And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. So now we're seeing that there's like, this is all regarding the secret worship that's happening in occult circles, yeah. you know, around the world. He says, So I went in and I saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So the first one was out in the open. This next one is behind a hidden wall and is in not just one image, but a whole array of uh, idols at this stage. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. So who's hiding behind this door? Is it is it pagan witches or is it God, supposed to be God's people yep. at this point? It says 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. So it's not like the Canaanites or the Moabites, or these are the Israelites doing yeah. this abominable stuff. And in the midst of them, Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censure in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. Well, what is that in relation to? What is incense and censer found in, in the old sanctuary service? It has to do with the prayers and the Holy Spirit. Yes. So now it's not just they're doing this in secret, the men of Israel behind closed doors with abominations, but they're even taking tokens of what was in the holy place, the censure, the thick cloud of incense, which represents the prayers of the saints. Like all of these things are being done in this secret abomination worship. Are these things still happening today? As if it was right. As if it was right. But they must know on some level it can't be right because they're doing these things in secret, right? They're not publicly out you know, swinging these things around. Uh, You know, is there a group today that swings these things around that calls themselves Christians that worship idols? Yes. Then on verse 12, Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Mm -hmm. Every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. So they don't think that the Lord can see behind these secret walls and these secret chambers. He said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see a greater abomination. So there's something worse than secret idol worship from God's own, seemingly God's own people happening with elements from his holy temple. Yeah. There's worse things than that. That's crazy. So verse 14, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat a woman weeping for Tammuz. So here, there's someone in front of the Lord's house. This is again the sanctuary of the temple. And she's weeping for Tammuz, who we're going to look at more. But, you know, what is the very first commandment? It says, thou shalt have no gods before me. Mm-hmm. Well, who is Tammuz? We're going to look at that here in a little bit. Then he said, uh, he said unto me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. So there's something worse than worshiping another god outside of the doors of God's house. That's crazy. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold... And, and, and I just want to pause there because <clears throat> we see this in intensity, not only in the evil things that are happening, but how close it is coming to the throne of God. Mm. First, we're outside. Then we're at the gate by the altar. And then we're by the incense. And now we're going to the inner court yep. of the Lord's house to these great abominations. Yep. And who has access to the inner court? These are the priests. Yep. Right? So now it's not just the ancients of Israel 
the high priest. These are the priests, the high priest. These are the people that are like, yep. you know, not, not just supposed to be God's people as a population, but literally his ministers yep. un, unto him as, as a priesthood. So it says, And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord's and their faces faced toward the east. Which, where does the sun rise in the morning? In the east. In the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. This is the greatest abomination. This is the last thing he mentions, yep. is the worship of the sun by people who say they're God's priests. And there's nothing higher than that. So we must ask, what is the most abominable thing in God's eyes in all of ancient Israel? Is worshiping the sun. Sun worship. Literally sun worship. Doesn't get worse. And that's the key point here, because when you come to Sabbath verse Sunday, that's actually the defining line here. Yeah. And yes, there's the arguments that people say, well, we worship on Sunday because of the resurrection of Christ. But number one, there's no biblical evidence for that. Number two, there's not even historical evidence for that. And as we keep going, we're going to show that none of the entities out there, except the modern ones who are making excuses for worshiping on Sunday, they know that Sunday has nothing to do with the Bible. Mm -hmm. So we have this, this divergent, this dichotomy between what God wants in his most holy inner court and what they are doing, which is facing towards the sun, mm -hmm. connected with the one that just before was weeping for Tammuz. Mm -hmm. So let's dig into this. Now we need to see why does God hate sun worship so much? And I think the important thing in this is start to look at the lineage of sun worship. Where did it come from? What, what does it say about the, this element of sun worship and the sun god? And so we're going to look at that now. And it's going to take us to the story of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Yep. And interestingly enough, we saw Tammuz was one of the names in the Bible, so people can't say we're just picking and choosing. God has mentioned Tammuz by name yep. as one of these gods. <clears throat> And what's, you know, we could do a whole thing on Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, and we're not going to get into that today. But we see Nimrod acts as the sun god type. Uh, Semiramis acts as the, um, the, the Mary character, the virgin birth of the sun, Tammuz, who in uh, occult teachings was born on December 25th. Mm -hmm. So we could get into the whole thing of why Chris... Christ Mass, yeah. a Catholic construct, is celebrated on December 25th when there's no uh, evidence to suggest that's when Jesus was born. In fact, there's evidence to support that it was earlier in the year, not at the at the in the yeah. middle of winter. But we do see a very clear, and anyone who looks can find this, that Tammuz is always connected to December 25th. So that's an interesting side note. Let's look at this story. Now, I forgot to add the citation on this, so this is, this is coming from an online source. It says, the story of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz is a legend. Now, I want to I stop there because this source calls this a legend. Yeah. What does legend mean? That means it's just a story. It's not it's real, not right? It's not based in reality. But I want right. to quickly jump, and I'm going to go back to this, the, this slide. But we know Nimrod is not legend, just like we know the Tower of Babel is not legend because he, he built that as well. Because we can see in Genesis a lineage of where Nimrod came from, yep. who he came from, and what his offspring were. And you can trace that, continue tracing that line, you know, like you can with Jesus, all the way through time. Yep. So there's nothing legend about Semiramis, Nimrod, and Tammuz. These were real entities, real people. So uh, the, the legend that is associated with the origins of sun worship and the origins of various Near Eastern religions. So it's not just the sun worship that originates in Babylon. It extends out to the, what are considered by most in the world the most ancient civilizations. Yep. And you're talking the ancient Hindu and India and ancient yep. Chinese you know, cultures. People see the, that as like yep. predating everything. Mm -hmm. But when you see Babylon actually came first and then those other two cultures. And when I was digging a long time ago into seeing at the oldest verifiable records in both the uh, in India-based cultures as well as the China-based cultures, or the, the Asian, I'll say, 
as, as well, the very earliest verifiable records of worshiping gods in those cultures were sun gods. So no matter what you do, and people say, oh, well, there's records that go back 40,000 years. There's no way to prove that that's true. What, you, what we can find that is provable, the earliest ones all relate back to yep. the sun god. <clears throat> so this is a true statement. It says, <clears throat> according to the legend, which we know it's not legend, Nimrod was a powerful king who ruled over the city of Babylon, which is a very real city. Iraq is, is the modern-day location of that. He was known for his great strength and his ability to conquer other nations. He's said to have built the famous Tower of Babel in order to reach the heavens and make a name for himself. So this is a, a system by the works of man's hands. He's yep. going to attain uh, the heights of heaven. And this is actually on the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this. some of the, the deified story connected to Nimrod is obviously, you could say, is legend. legend. Yeah. But the, the character... And the, the people that they connected these to are very real, yeah. and very real events and places. Exactly, and the places are real, the people are real, and then maybe some of the elements within the occult versions become legends because she, he, she said he went and became the sun god. Well, let's yeah. keep going here. So <clears throat> Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, is said to have become pregnant while her husband was away on a military campaign. You could see how that would be problematic. So now yep. you need a virgin... Uh, uh, birth and conception for that. She claimed that the child was conceived miraculously and that the father was the sun god. She named the child Tammuz and declared that he was the reincarnation of her deceased husband Nimrod. So yep. the child she had is also her husband, and he's also the sun god incarnate in this yep. immortal son Tammuz. So the woman weeping out in front of uh, the Lord's house, weeping for Tammuz, is literally weeping for a, fal a, a false god, so breaking the first yep. commandment. False right Christ. That. Exactly. It even is a false Christ type. After Nimrod's death, Semiramis became the queen regent or the queen of heaven. Who holds that title today in the Catholic Church? Mary. Mary in the Catholic Church, they call her the queen of heaven. That first title came from Semiramis and was transferred down to Isis. Isis was also called the queen of heaven. So you see this thread, even though they taken poor Mary, the real Mary, and just run her through the, the mud in this uh, Catholic system, we can start to see the connections between those. She claimed that, the, that Tammuz was the son of the sun god and that he has power to bring fertility to the land and bring the dead back, back to, to life. Way. Well, who has the power to bring fertility to the land and the dead back to life in real life? Only God. Only God. Okay, so we're starting to see elements of this sun worship are going to take claims and titles that only the real God of heaven has claims to. So but that's exactly why, again, we're going to see those things taking place, because the exaltation of that last move to Sunday, sun worship, has to be brought in with all the things connected to that issue of Tammuz and the issue of them facing the East. Yeah, and it, it will all come back to, you know, <clears throat> counterfeit things that God has made for him himself and to show us in the Bible what those things are. The chief god of Babylon, Marduk, and Nimrod was worshipped as Marduk in this system, was associated with the sun and was considered the creator of the world. So again, another title that God takes, and it's even baked into his commandment at number four. Yeah. It says, they also worshipped the god of the sky and fertility named Ishtar, also known as Semiramis and Isis, who was associated with the sun and the morning star. Yep. So again, everything is connecting to titles and elements that are God's titles. We know Jesus is the bright and morning star. We also know uh, Lucifer has been uh, referred to as the morning star. And as you notice, that the names change. Because depending on the situation, depending on the culture that was talking about it, they had a different word yep. for the God. And we'll start to see that as well. Um, so I wanted to kind of show that it's not just, you know, Matt McKenzie coming up with this, but here's an article that talks about how sun worship and the sun god literally spanned all cultures, all religions, and all of history. And we're going to read here. It says, the Bible has quite a bit to say about sun worship. It's believed that the sun was responsible for bringing about each new day and warming the earth. This is true. Sun worship was also prevalent in the ancient Egyptian and Babylonian civilizations, which we're going to look at even more. The ancient Egyptian god of creation, Amun, is believed to reside inside of the sun. 
which is the same thing that Nimrod did. He resided yeah. inside the sun. Also in Egypt, there was a religion that worshipped the sun directly. Sun worship became the dominant religion in all ancient civilizations, from Babylon to India, China, Africa, Greece, Rome, Mexico, South America, Egypt, and Europe. Yeah. Eminent astrologers and Sanskrit scholar Jata Shakar Ja said that the concept of sun worship is as old as mankind. In societies, they were primarily agricultural and dependent on the sun for life and sustenance. It's no surprise that the sun became deified. Says Surya, Surya is the Hindu god of the sun. He is considered to be the creator of the universe and the source of all life. Mm -hmm. Who has those claims? Creator oh. of the universe and source of all life. These are God's claims again. Yeah. And here the sun god is taking these claims. He is the supreme soul who brings light and warmth to the world. <coughs> again, what God does. Ja points out that the people in ancient Egypt worshipped Ra, the sun god, as they believed it to be the source of life. Who's yeah. the source of life? Okay, this is God again in contrast to this. Yep. The Greek honored Helios, who was similar to Ra in many aspects. In many Native American cultures, the sun god was re represented and recognized as the life-giving force. Again, title of God. Worship of the sun was important among the Romans as well. Yep. No question about that. So I wanted to just quickly run through some archaeological elements that show that, you know, where the history shows these cultures worshipped the sun. You can't deny history. No. You can't deny these artifacts, and they just solidify the fact that this origination with Nimrod and Tammuz <clears throat> and the sun god goes back to everything. And, you know, getting a little bit off, not to go off topic, but there's speculation that Nimrod had a lot of influence around the world with all of the different civilizations. Yes. And that goes into some of these, what people are terming high civilizations. And you see this Nimrod type character on all these different places, which is why it would make sense that they all have this same deity mm -hmm. because he actually took part in uh, setting up these systems globally. Yes. And it, it all kind of stemmed, you know, the Tower of Babel, the whole world was yep. under one system. And then what did they do? They dispersed along the whole world. Yep. So it came from this central source and just started It was a one-world government. It was the last time that there was one-world government, and Satan's been trying to get it back to one yep. world ever since. And that's why he had to change all the languages and dismantle the Tower of Babel, basically, because it was... The devil was rushing so hard to get his system, and God said, no, you have to wait. Yeah. It's not time yet. Yeah. And we're very lucky that, that God stepped in at that point and, and gave us the time. Which also shows that God's in control. Like yep. We shouldn't be afraid of any of this stuff. Like he, He's allowing these things to happen. Yeah. So even though Satan's pulling all this stuff off, God is allowing it to happen. And we're just going to quickly run through. Here's the Babylonian sun god. We see again in reliefs uh, the elements of sun worship here, and you also see the sun and the sickle moon. This mm -hmm. is that half crescent moon, yep. and that's used a ton in Roman Catholicism, which we're going to get into in the next episode. This is kind of the history of it, and in the next episode, we're going to see how it's been refined and used and Christianized yep. today. So here's Babylon. Then we see at the same kind of point in time, you don't have to look very far. Sun symbolism all throughout Egyptian cultures. This is the sun god Ra. And oddly enough, it has multiple forms. There's male and female rays. When you look at the sun rays, they're not just you know rays. They're, they're, there's a, a male and female version of what the ray looks like. Uh -huh. And we're going to look more of that too because it goes back to reproduction yep. and the impregnation of, of semiramis being impregnated yep. by the male sun rays so on and so forth. But you also see this element of the serpent most often with the sun. And you'll see in this picture, the sun emblem sitting above the Egyptian god's head has a serpent coming out of it. Yep. And you see, again, in in uh, hieroglyphics and uh, ancient Egyptian sites all over the place, the sun and the serpent all over. And you've seen the all-seeing eye there too. The all-seeing eyes in there, which is, you know, we see on the back of the dollar bill. This is all hearkening back, and even the capstone is arrayed on the dollar bill with yep. a sun illumination behind it. So this is, again, uh, Egypt. You see mother and son. You see the child there. 
You'll see mother-son worship throughout this system. That's Semiramis and Tammuz worship, Isis and Horus and Set or uh, Osiris. All is within this son worship system. And we just see, you know, we could do a whole two-hour-long presentation just showing ancient uh, cultures and their relation to the sun god. So after Babylon, uh, after Egypt, you see uh, Medo-Persia comes in and refines this sun worship system into Mithraism. Yep. And we know that in today, even t- today, inside the inner circles of uh, the higher rankings of Catholicism, they are worshiping Mithra yep. and and talking about the appearance of Maitreya and, and some of these other elements. Mithra is still a very strong religious force. Within the super secretive elements, yep. especially. Uh, they This is like their preferred... Um, version of this mm-hmm. sun worship. And so we see that they have the sun emblem behind his head. Another one here, this is a, a little harder to see, but you can see the solar rays behind his head for the Egyptian, or excuse me, for Mithra uh, from uh, Persia. Then we see the Assyrian sun god, again, the sun and the sickle moon. Yep. You're going to see that sickle moon uh, all over the place in the modern day version of sun worship. Because that's see, going back to the womb. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And it, what is the uh, s- s- Islamic sign yep. is the star and the sickle moon. Yep. So uh, which came first, these cultures or Islam? Mm-hmm. Islam didn't come around till around 300 AD. Yep. So when you see the sickle moon and star, it's one of the reasons why I like signs and symbols so much, because you can trace them back to history and they always mean the same thing. So if you can find the origin, you can start to see where that system has leaked out into the world. And today, uh, you know, the, the Muslim religion is set up on this sun God concept, as is shown in their, um, some of their signs and symbols. Here's the Greek god, again, uh, Helios, with the sun symbol behind his head. And then here's one from, from pagan Rome, which is the Sol Invictus version of it. But it's not just in the, the cultures. What about modern-day religions? You see, the god of the sun in Hinduism is known as Sira. He's often depicted as riding a chariot harnessed by seven horses, so the number seven, again, that's a very uh, important number in God's system as well, which represented the seven colors of light and the seven days of the week. Sura is considered the dispeller of darkness, the provider of life and growth, and is worshipped by many devotees for health, prosperity, and well-being. So again, all these elements which would typically represent God's system. And even in Buddhism, the sun may be used in Buddhist teachings as a metaphor or symbol for enlightenment or dispel ignorance. And you can see, again, uh, if you go into, into Thailand and parts of Asia, there are sun symbols behind all of these uh, Buddhist deity um, statues yeah. or idols that they have. So we're starting to see there's no question that sun worship has prevailed through this, all these cultures. Then I got interested and started to say, okay, well, what are all the gods with the lowercase g in the Bible that God specifically warns against? Yep. And oddly enough, there's seven of them that he mentions by name. You have Baal, Ashtoreth, or Ashtore, Asherah, Shamos, Dagon, Molech, and Tammuz. So that's seven different gods, right? Yep. Well, it looks like it. Because really what we see is Baal... When you look at Baal and other cultures, and again, this is from an outside source, we see that Baal has the name of Marduk, has the name of Tammuz, Dagon, Jupiter, Nimrod, Mithra, Ra. So is it seven gods or is it one? It's the one. It's, it's the same god. It's the same entity yep. behind all of them. So I want to start looking at, because we don't have to look at 50 <clears throat> different entities, let's look at Baal first. It says, he is thought by many scholars to be a Canaanite version of the Babylonian god Marduk. Yep. Okay, so Baal and Marduk are the same thing. Same thing. And identical with the Assyrian deity Hadad. In Canaanite lore, he was the ruler of heaven and the god of the sun. Yep. So again, you know, we're starting to see a trend here. Ruler of heaven, another title from God himself. Okay, but now that we see that Baal and Marduk are the same, let's peek closer at the story behind Marduk says the chief god of Babylon, Marduk, the immortal son of Utu. So now, God and his immortal son. So we're seeing the element of even knocking off this father-son relationship and the immortal nature of the son, or the bull calf of the sun god, Utu. And we've seen, what uh, what did the ancient Israelites make? And that's why God was so upset that they did that. Yes. Right below where he was giving them the Ten Commandments, 
they put up a calf, which was representing the sun god. The sun god, right? And this all goes back. It says by the Hammurabi period, and this is Hammurabi's code, Marduk had become astrologically associated with the planet Jupiter, which is interesting because by the time it, all the um, gods transferred from Greek to Rome, well, the Greek god Zeus is in Roman culture known as Jupiter, mm-hmm. and you'll find Jupiter in the Vatican today. And then the Jupiter became Peter in St. Peter's Basilica. And we're going to look at that in the next episode, which is, is it's crazy. They've just transferred these these pagan entities. It's just a shift. Yeah. It's just a term for the same thing over and over and over because it's the same battle, the same great controversy that, that God is fighting is his day or Sunday. Mm-hmm. Now, it wasn't called Sunday from the first. It was the first day. Yep. But it is in honor of the sun. Exactly. Exactly. So it says, Marduk took on increasing significance for the city of Babylon, becoming finally the most important and powerful god of Babylonia. He was regarded as the creator of the heavens and the earth. Literally, the fourth commandment yep. taken off the table. Yep. Now, there's another one. Chamos or Shamos. Utu or Shamash, as it was later known, was worshipped by the ancient Mesopotamians as a solar deity, as the god of the sun. So of these seven names, one of the identifying characteristics for all seven, even though it's one entity, is that they're all identified with the sun. Utu was responsible for ensuring that the sun took its daily path across the heavens, as the sun is the source of all life on earth. What's the source of all life on earth? God. God, not the sun. God who put the sun in the sky is the source of all life. This was an important task. Nevertheless, Utu's job was much more than just giving life to the world. The Mesopotamians believed that in his capacity as a sun god, Utu had the power to see all that was going on in the world during the day. This also meant that he was able to see through deception and deceit. God does the same thing. Thus, Utu was worshipped as the god of truth and justice. Who's the real god of truth and justice? Again, knocking off all these roles. In this role, Utu served as both judges of men and gods. Who's the judge of all? Yep, the Christ. real God. And the gods that are talking here, we'd say he's judging the, the fallen angels in this sense. At night, Utu became the judge of the underworld. Utu's association uh, with justice is also <laughs> evident in the claim made by the Babylonian king Hammurabi that his code, which is the Hammurabi code, is one of the earliest legal frameworks in human history that's known, it was given to him by the sun god and was implemented at the command of the sun god. Now, for people who think, well, this is all just ancient religious thought, it doesn't matter. If you go to the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. today, you'll find that there's a relief on the south side of the building. And on it, they have this history of lawmakers. And one of the earliest ones was Hammurabi. And it even says on the U.S. Supreme Court website that Hammurabi received the the first stone of the code, which is the the one on the top there, depicts him receiving the law from the Babylonian sun god. So the entity at the very front of this image is the sun god handing down his law all through time, and they, they have it here etched in stone on the premier uh, leg- law uh, interpretive body in the United States. So there's no question that these people understand this code that they even, in another place I have, yep. that shows that this is like part of what makes the U.S. legal framework is based on the Hammurabi code, that they got this from the sun god. Well, and this is, goes back to some of our first episodes where we were talking about the origin of America because it was this lamb-like like government, which was supposed to be about freedom, but at the same time, these people, when it was being founded, were trying to get their things implemented in here, and when all these buildings were put in, you, you can see that. Because if it was only Christian Protestants who were in the development of America, you wouldn't see a Babylonian God Mm -hmm. as the lawmaker given down through the ages and now into the building. Exactly. And so, and and they, they, 
They pay homage to it. And I could do all sorts of sun worship homage that's being paid in government buildings and cityscapes all across the United States and the world. But this is just one example. Hammurabi got his code from the sun god. So this law that he got in contrast to God's law that was implemented from Babylon. So we've seen all these attributes that are transferring sun worship from Babylon through these all these other systems. And they're taking all of these titles and claims that only the God of the Bible has made. So what does the fourth commandment specifically describe God's title as? Well, when we look at the fourth commandment, it has bro- it's broken down into different portions. And it says that he is the creator of heaven and earth. That is one of the main things. Mm-hmm. And these other gods are claimed to be the creator as well, the mm-hmm. life giver. Mm-hmm. And, and so right in that fourth commandment, it's defining who it's talking about. And this whole system is is all that goes on with what being the creator of the heavens and the earth means, being able to bring the dead back to life, <coughs> being the source of all life. So it's like it's within those titles, there's a whole bevy of descriptions that tell you what that makes up, the totality of what those titles mean. And since it's in the fourth commandment that says to honor the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, and then talks about God the creator, by keeping the Sabbath, you are showing which God you are in homage of. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a different day, then you're doing a different God. You're not doing the creator of heaven and earth. You're not doing the one that laid the foundations, Mm -hmm. the one of the Bible. You're doing something else, which is related to Tammuz and facing the East. Right. And we see that, you know, anybody can worship God on any day. But what did the two systems select as the days? Like we we pray and worship and and study every day. But we take that seventh day as a special set-aside to spend time. So what was... Why did God make the seventh day? What was the purpose of it? Well, he said to rest, and then it was to be a reflection to God. So that day would not be, you would not concern yourself with anything else other than the things of God. Right. So it was a seventh of your time set aside to focus on only heavenly, godly things and to worship God and commune with God, and to honor the one that was the creator in homage of the creation of the seven days. The whole point of the seventh day was to stop and remember (coughs) what God did during creation. So the purpose of it is to remember the creation and the creator, the the whole power that went into that. Now, when people say, well, I worship on the on Sunday because Christ resurrected, we are all for celebrating Christ's resurrection. But the purpose of the Sabbath, and I've even had uh, some Sunday Christians I see now calling Sunday Sabbath, the purpose of the Sabbath was not to remember Jesus' resurrection. It was to remember creation. Mm -hmm. The very first Sabbath, when was it kept? The first seventh day, Adam and Eve. This was before Sinai. This is before... And God rested on the seventh day after he created all things. He did it. He rested. He hallowed it. And then... People say, well, the commandments came around at Sinai. Well, how could that be if Adam and Eve were to sin, and sin is a transgression of the law? There had to be a law in Mm -hmm. Eden that they transgressed. And they kept the Sabbath because the first Sabbath was on that first seventh day. And every Sabbath since in Eden was kept by Adam and Eve. So people who say Sinai was the first time that the law was given, no, that was when the people of Egypt, uh, the Israelites in Egypt forgot the law lost God, and the commandments were a reiteration of what has been there since the beginning. The Exodus took place... I I don't think people understand the chronology of what happened. The Exodus wasn't, you know, a hundred years after Eden, or 500 years after Eden, or a thousand years after Eden. It was thousands of years after Eden. Mm -hmm. It was a long space of time. So there was a lot of things that took place before actually that exodus from Egypt happened. And if that's the first place the 
that the Sabbath was introduced or any of the Ten Commandments, that doesn't make any sense because all the time before, we have all these examples of breaking the Ten Commandments mm -hmm. and it talking about that before they were physically given on tablets of stone so that they could tangibly hold on to them. And that was the point of, of them being received at Sinai. Wasn't that it was this new thing, it was a reiteration, it was a physical gang, um, physical thing that they could hold. That's why we say, oh, you know, well, it's not written in stone. You know, we have that saying, mm -hmm. and that comes straight from the Ten Commandments Bible because reference. they were written right. in stone. Right. And if there was no law, there would have been no way for Adam and Eve to sin <clears throat> because literally the definition is the transgression of the, the law. And it's not talking about the law of Moses because <laughs> Moses doesn't come around. The ceremonial yep. law doesn't come around for thousands of years at this point. It has to be the Ten Commandments, which is the same one that sits inside the Ark of the Covenant as this distinguishing factor um, throughout history. If the Ten Commandments weren't binding, then what about when Cain killed Abel? So there was no such thing as thou shalt not kill. Well, obviously there was such thing as thou shalt not kill because he got in trouble for that. Yeah. And then we have, even before the uh, Sinai took place, it says, I need my people to rest on the Sabbath day. And Pharaoh says, no, I'll make them work twice as hard on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Well, where's the Sabbath? If there's no Sabbath, obviously there was a Sabbath because they're they're referencing it. Pharaoh is referencing it. No doubt about it. Um, and so, you know, all of these things are to show. We showed <coughs> at the beginning. There's two signs of allegiance. There's a mark of the beast and a seal of God. You can yep. create, call it the seal of the beast and the mark of God if you want. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the same two thing. elements that stand out that show that you honor and acknowledge this system or this yep. system. Now, as we see on the screen, we have main attributes of the sun worship. We saw that the worship, all seven of these points are in relation to God's true titles or his son's true titles. The first is it worships the S-U-N, the object, uh -huh. versus the S-O-N. So even the deception in the sun versus the sun, yep. two different spellings. And people will say, well, God, Jesus is described as the S-U-N of righteousness. That's correct, because the object is supposed to represent Christ. Mm -hmm. But in this system... It's a type. It's not something that we should worship in place of him. Correct. You know, we have all the types throughout the Old Testament. We, they sacrificed a lamb that represented the death of Christ. But you weren't supposed to, that lamb didn't become God now. You weren't supposed to worship the <coughs> lamb. No. Yeah. So these types are just so that we can grasp the concept, yep. not that we replace God with yeah, them. Yeah, the object now becomes the attention of this worship system, the physical object versus the thing the object represents. And the reason it's so bright and life-giving and all this stuff is because Christ is the brightness, the truth, the way, the truth, the life, the light of the world. You know, so the, the, the object can be used, the S-U-N of righteousness can be point to Jesus, but we can't worship the object itself and call it a God. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems. It claims to be the source of all creation, which is obviously we, we just looked at. It claims to be the source of all life, claims to be, see all things because it could see in deceit yep. and behind walls, and claims to be the source of truth and justice found in all cultures, major culture, cultures in history. And the last piece we're going to touch on this episode is it's always associated with the first day of the week. Yep. Now, all of these components <clears throat> that we're seeing here, we're, we're seeing that sun worship, the reason God hates it so much is it's the fullness of everything that is against counter God. God. Counter to God, the mm -hmm. counterfeit of God. So it's not just Tammuz worshiping, uh, woman weeping for Tammuz. Yep. It's not just idols. It's every everything aspect combined. of God's claims is wrapped up in sun worship, which now makes sense why in the hierarchy it sits uh, at, the very top. at the very top. So let's see... The relationship with this sun worship and Sunday to the first day, Sunday first day. And there's actually an interesting book called Sunday, A History of the First Day from Babylonia to the Super Bowl. So it's saying from uh, Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz's time all the way up yep. to the time we're living in today. And the whole book touches on the fact that Sunday has always been the first day in every single culture. Let's read a couple things here. More important in raising the status of Sunday among pagans was Mithraism. Mithraism, as we see now, is like is really prevalent in, you know, we saw in the Man of Metals, 
in Daniel 2, that the Babylon's the head of gold, and then the value of the metals decreases, but the strength of the metal increases, yep. right? So as this sun worship gets passed down from Babylon, it enters Medo-Persia and becomes Mithraism. So it says, then this movement was related to the emperor's invisible sun cult, but carried much broader appeal, especially among the empire's multitude of soldiers, talking about Rome now. Followers of Mithra did emphasize someday and was greater in, with greater impact than early Christians. So it's Mithraism that really gave vibrance yep. to this adoration of the first day Sunday. A follow, uh, in fact, they may have influenced the Christian choice of the first day for worship and some Christian forms of worship. So Mithraism really did a number mm -hmm. on Christianity. Purification by baptism, the virtues of abstinence and self-control, belief in resurrection, setting aside heaven for the pure and hell for the pure and hell for the sinful, and celebrating the birth of their God on December 25th are all obvious parallels. So uh -huh. we're seeing paganism has turned Christianized, and we're gonna next episode really look at the power that did this. Another was Mithraism's treatment of Sunday. It was honored with rituals unique to that day, whether during communal worship, in subterranean caves, or in banqueting, taking rest, and refraining from customary daily bath at home. So even the sun god element takes yep. you know, pieces of the real, the, the idea of resting, uh, the idea of fellowship with like believers, all things that you do on the real Sabbath. And it's and it's interesting. They say that most likely the early Christians took that from these from Mithraism. Yes. And the parallels. Well, why is there the parallels? Because Satan is counterfeiting everything of God. So you have to have the parallels because he wants to be in place of God. Yep. He doesn't want a totally independent structure that's totally different. He wants God's structure. He wants to be that that force, mm -hmm. right? So it's interesting how even here um, they're showing that connection because really the early Christians, Sunday, while well, he was talking right here, the first day of worship, Christians weren't the first ones to worship on the first day because Christ rose. Right. You know, that, that happened way later. That concept of worshiping on the first day was set way, way yeah. before... Uh, Thousands of years. Yeah, before Christians. So it says, in sum, the question of pagan influence upon the new <clears throat> Lord's Day, which in another episode we're going to tackle why the Lord's Day is not Sunday, but is Sabbath and has always been the seventh day, but we're not going to touch on that today. And vice versa is another tough problem. But the adoption of Sunday as the high point of the week by many Roman pagans undoubtedly boosted the, the day's importance. So before... Catholicism became uh, a system. You had pagan Rome, and pagan Rome uplifted sun worship on the first day as the reason, and I don't think I put this slide in here, but the reason they put the focus on the first day is because the sun god is the most preeminent god. So your most preeminent god goes on the first day. Yep. And so it's the most important first day, but here we see that is total contrast to yep. the god of the exactly. Bible, which says the seventh day. So I actually did include this slide that I, I wasn't sure if I included. So let's read this one here. It says, Sunday worship is the setting aside of the first day of the week for the worship of the sun deity, known in Babylon as Tammuz, in Persia as Mithra, and the Roman cult of Mithra was based on the Persian, Persian uh, deity. In Greece as Helios, in Rome as Sol Invictus, the unconquerable sun. Sun worship became the dominant religion in all ancient civilizations, spreading from Mother Babylon to India, China, Africa, Greece, Rome, Mexico, South America, Egypt, and Europe, as we saw. Historically, pagan Babylon worshipped the sun as a deity, and pagan religions also worshipped the invincible sun. The first day of the week, the most preeminent position in the week, was therefore given to the worship of the sun in the calendars of the ancients. And so now we're going to end here with looking at how did all of this get transferred to be a Christian thing? Yeah. Because here we are today, Sunday is the most prominent day for worship in the whole world for Christian for the Christian world. And we're going to see and start looking at the modern day priesthood of the sun god which we yep. now call today the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic priesthood. These are the modern-day priests of Horus, Osiris, Nimrod. Uh, these are the priests of the sun god. And we're going to look at that by their own words, yep. how they define Sunday, 
And we t- looked at earlier <clears throat> the two marks, defining marks of authority of who you're you're following. And let's look at their own words. And we're just going to tease uh, what we're going to cover in the next yep. episode, so people can see how would this crossover happens. Because now we've gone all the way through history, and now we're right up to the point where paganism is ending and the Christian aspect is coming in. This is the culmination of the whole thing. Exactly. It's, it's the most important part because, yes, it's great to understand the history, and you need to know the history, but then how that took place and how it's going to continue to take place, that's the key, right, what we're going to look at. And I would say the average Protestant, the <coughs> average Christian, non-Catholic Christian, let's say, would say that the Bible is generally their guide and that they live by the what the Bible says and not what tradition mm-hmm. says or what Catholics say or whatever. So let's see what the Roman priesthood, the priesthood of the sun god, says about this today. It says, the Protestants claim to stand upon the written word only. In fact, that was the basis of the Reformation. It was sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. That was their justification for separating with the church, that we want to do just what the Bible says. Now, here's continuing with what the Catholic Church says. They profess to hold the scripture alone as the standard of their faith. They justify their revolt. That's the revolu- uh, um, Reformation. And, and this is the Catholic Church speaking. Yeah. Just want to emphasize that. This is from an article that we're going to look at uh, a lot, uh, the, for a series of four articles that we're going to look at a lot in the next episode. But just to kind of give you a, a quick view of what's in these articles, and we're going to tell you where they came from uh, in the next episode. But this is from the 1893, a- after the, the Supreme Court has made a, a ruling about America being a Christian nation, and yep. Seventh-day Adventists wrote something in response to that, and this is Rome's response to the Adventists. Mm-hmm. So it says, and, and to the rest of the Christian world by proxy through Adventism. It says, uh, so they hold the scripture as alone as the standard of faith. They justify their revolt, the, the Reformation, by the plea that the church has apostatized from the written word and follows tradition. So they're saying that the whole Reformation was based on the fact that the Catholic Church had fallen and they no longer followed the Bible, they were just following their own traditions. Now, the Protestants claim that they stand upon the written word only is not true. Mm -hmm. Their profession of holding the scriptures alone as a standard of faith is false. So here, (laughs) the Catholic priests are coming out and basically saying that you can't possibly stand on scripture alone. And here's the proof. The proof is the written word explicitly enjoins the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. They do not observe the seventh day, but reject it. He's talking about all of Protestantism, yep. anyone who holds Sunday. If they do true hold the scriptures alone as their standard, they would be observing the seventh day as is enjoined in the scriptures throughout, from beginning to end. And we're going to see they dive even more into this. As we're not going to cover it today, but we will soon. Yet they not only reject the observance of the Sabbath enjoined in the written word, but they have adopted and do practice the observance of Sunday, for Mm -hmm. which they have only the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. Consequently, the claim of Scripture alone as the standard fails, and the doctrine of Scripture and tradition as essential is fully established, the Protestants themselves being judges. Wow. It's quite the statement against those who are saying that they are living by the Bible, and the Catholic Church <clears throat> are doing two things here. They're actually saying, number one, that you guys are wrong. Number two, we don't live by the Scripture and the Bible alone. We believe in tradition, and tradition overrides the Bible. Mm-hmm. And that is exactly what true Catholics believe, that tradition is higher than the Bible. My own grandmother said so. She's a Catholic. She said, the difference between you and me is you believe the Bible, I believe the Bible and tradition, tradition overrides the Bible. And we're going to look a lot at this in the next episode, where we are going to dive all the way in to these, this, the first article of the four that, uh, that covered this topic. And we're going to see that the, the reason God hates sun worship so much is it is the sign or the mark of the opposite system. There's only two systems in the world, and it's the mark of that opposite system, as we've gone through in detail. But the next episode, we're now going to continue in to the modern-day lineage of Sunday worship. And I think, you know, there's a lot of good Christians out there in Sunday churches. We are not condemning those people. We are not saying that yeah. they are worshiping Satan in, in a knowing manner. That's the reason why the... Uh, calling out of Babylon is still possible 
after That's what it says in Revelation. It says that our message now yep. is come out of Babylon. Right. Because the whole Sunday system is the Babylon system. Correct. It's Tammuz, it's Nimrod, it's the whole sun worship. And we're calling them to leave the Babylonian system. Yeah. And and that's why it calls it Mystery Babylon at the mm-hmm. end. Because it started with Babylon, in the end it is still Babylon. It says they, their, their uh, rule was uh, extended for a season and a time. That's because the ideologies and mindsets and worship practices yep. all transferred down through time into the modern day world. Roman Catholic priesthood, which now, as the mark of her authority, she calls herself the Mother Church, now shows that if you worship, whether you realize it or not, if you worship on this day, you're actually disregarding the God of the Bible and acknowledging the power and tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. Next episode, we're going to dive in even further. Uh, We actually ask any Catholics watching, go talk to your priest, ask him if this is true. We're actually going to be creating a list of questions that you can take to your priest, and you're going to be shocked with the answers that they give you, because they won't deny the facts that we're telling you. They're simply going to tell you, well, you have a choice then. You can either follow the God of the Bible, or you can follow the Catholic Church like you have been most of your life, but they won't say that anything we've said here is, is a lie. They acknowledge that Sunday is this paganized version that's been rolled over into Christian, uh, the Christian religion and is adopted by the whole world. So next episode, we'll take another step in looking at this even closer to tr- really try to help people understand what is holy and good in God's eyes yeah. and what is not holy and good so they can receive the seal of God and, and avoid, avoid the mark of the beast. Yep. Avoid the mark of the beast and avoid the plagues and the wrath of God because we don't want anybody to be lost. We don't want anybody to be caught unawares when these things start taking place and when they're getting real pressures from the government, from the world, from people against what God is asking to do. They need to have faith and realize that God is in control. That's another thing that some of the things taking place can be very scary. And a lot of people just, oh, I don't want to hear it because it's, it's, it's um, you know, caused me stress. But we need to give that to God because like you said, when we looked at Babel and God deconstructed that because it wasn't time, that God is in control of when all of these things take place. He's not just allowing the devil to run loose and run rampant. He's the one in control of it all. And we need to have faith that he is going to be protecting us from these things as well. And that the only things that take place are the good for those who are trying to honor him. That's Romans 8.28. That's my favorite Bible verse. That uh, everything works together for good for those that are called according to his purpose. Mm. And when we look at the fourth commandment and we look at the seal of God versus the mark of the beast, we see this distinction, but there's a protection connected to following God. Mm. Not only temporally now, but that we have a hope later that... He is coming again, that he, we are going to be part of his new kingdom when sin is entirely done away with. Mm-hmm. So I hope you guys were able to learn something. Our goal is to just try to help and, and educate <clears throat> people who don't believe. Just listen and question and then go out and take what we've said and, and see if it's true within the world and within your own research. But once you know that there's a difference between God's holy day and, and this system of sun worship on Sunday, you have a choice to make. Uh, but go to God, and he will not turn you away, nor leave you, nor forsake you. So thank you once again, Brother McKenzie, uh, and looking forward to going in the next episode soon. Thank you, and make sure you guys like, share, and subscribe. And in case we keep having issues on YouTube or other platforms, go to adtv.watch, make your login, stay connected with all the things that are coming out from Amazing Discoveries, and we will see you in the next one.